To say it's a monumental day for our franchise is clearly an understatement. Winning the grand final of the championship this year was just a very, very spectacular uh, achievement and sitting here today with one of the world's best rugby players is that second achievement. So uh, we've signed on it clearly a, a world-class international player, but I'm also conscious of course that we've signed on what I keep calling a brand. For me, yes, I'm a sportsman. Um, but I need to have that purpose, something that I really believe in. And, you know, just his philosophy on how he wants to play the game. I feel like the way that I strive to play the game, um, I could be really suited to their style of, of play. So um, there's a bit of pressure there, but it's so exciting. I heard about uh, Wolfpack when Eric Perez brought his partner uh, over to the UK and visited uh, the Rhinos. Uh, they were consulting with Gary Eddington about, you know, this new venture. But the concept of it, though, when it actually started to get legs and it started to get traction, and I thought, you know, most people are thinking there's going to be something in this. And then when the when the the headlines hit the media that that they are a, a bona fide club and they are coming to the, into the into the league in 2017. Uh, it, I think it made everybody sit up straight, and f you know, for my time within the game, you know, I, I know, it, I, I believe the answer is expansion. After 20 and something years of banging the similar drum, it's not always been the same drum, but we're banging a similar drum, give or take, different playoff systems and different junior systems and variance in salary caps. So you, you'd have to say something's different, has got to change. I believe it's got to be expansion. It all got started when I was in Birmingham watching television, looking for rugby actually, because I was a rugby fan. But in Canada, we only knew of one rugby. We didn't know rugby union, we didn't know rugby league, we just knew rugby. So I was flipping it and I saw Bradford versus Leeds. And I flipped it on and I was just taken by the action. The action was unbelievable. The, the game, the speed, and I just wanted to look into what it was because it wasn't rugby that I recognized. I didn't understand the rules, I didn't know what was going on. So what I did was I kind of went on Google and I checked out the history of it and I realized it was sort of banned in Canada in the turn of the last century, just like rugby league was banned in this country in many institutions. So I decided I wanted to right that wrong and I started a Canadian federation. Uh, and then I took it from there. I said, you know what? Let's see how far I can take this thing. And I sort of gave up everything and dedicated to rugby league. And I was introduced to the CEO, Nigel Wood of the RFL and the COO, Ralph Rimmer. And I sort of said, listen, my idea, and it's always been my idea from day one, is to bring a Toronto team into Super League. Now at the time there was no promotion relegation. So you could maybe go straight to Super League. Uh, it, while we were in these negotiations and these talks, it went back to the uh, promotion relegation system. So uh, the, the dream then became, let's get into League One and move our way up. And a long story short, we eventually got the clubs to approve our entry into League One. Really, there was only a at one point a time when only Nigel Wood and Ralph Rimmer believed in this. I was approached by uh, Eric Perez. And he will tell you he approached me because he saw a game, a Leeds Bradford game in 2003, a grand final. I'm gonna, and Eric would say, I'm gonna get that man to coach my team. Anyway, he approached me along with, originally it was uh, Adam Fogarty, one of the icons of our game. When you see him in the stands every big game, Adam's there. That it's hard to miss Adam. Um, and so I met them at uh, Greg's pastry shop at Cleck Eaton. So, so it wasn't the Hilton, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't any salubrious nightclub in London. It was Greg's uh, shop in Cleck Eaton roundabout and uh, Foggy was there eating a Cornish pasty, bought me a Cornish pasty kindly. And Eric was there, we, we wanted to coach his team. You know, at the time we had a set of investors 
And right before we, you know, right, right around the time we were going to sign the agreement, uh, the RFL kind of changed the deal and said we couldn't get central distribution. So we lost our investors. You know, I started hustling and going downtown and with Toronto and just trying to get make as many contacts as possible. And within a few weeks of that, uh, I ended up meeting David Argyle. Uh, now, mind you, we'd already been approved at this time. So David Argyle, I met him in September 2015. And by December that year, we had a deal and he became the principal investor. But he did say, I, I need to go over to the UK with you and just make sure that everything you're saying is real. Uh, so we went to the grand final that year and obviously he met everyone and he, he verified that it was all real and, uh, and then stamp, stamp of approval. Well, er Eric Perez came and saw me just over a year ago and told me the, his vision on bringing a, a league team across the Atlantic and uh, having played uh, rugby uh, and rugby gave a lot to me. It, this is a little way, a little bit for me to give back to rugby and, and give some opportunity for people to, uh, to play the game competitively. I thought long and hard about it. Did I want to commit, especially with Transatlantic? Could I be doing 80 hours a week? I had some things going on in, in my own life at the time thinking, and I'm a big believer if you commit to something, you've got to give it your all to be reasonably successful. And so I kind of got, not collie wobbles, but I was thinking about, I thought, this isn't amazing. I'd love to be part of this adventure. And, and so I met them again and again. Um, I went actually down to um, uh, London with Adam Fogarty then when I said I was interested and Eric Perez and we met David Argyle, the owner. And I kind of agreed terms in relation to coaching, but still there was a doubt in the back of my mind. And I convinced myself on the way back on the train they were great. David Argyle said, it was the first time one of the owners said, well, what do you want? I went, well, you're going to agree to everything I say. And I went, yeah, so that's unusual. Nobody normally does that. Then there's a kind of fight process where I have to fight for this and fight for that. Anyway, so we agreed terms. Long and short of it, I got cold feet that back end of that week, arranged to meet Eric again um, back in the north of England in Huddersfield um, and Adam. I said, mate, I, I, Genuinely, I don't want to waste your time. Uh, I think it's a massive, I think what you've told me is unbelievably exciting. I think it's great for the game in England. I think it's going to be a huge success, but, and they asked me, well, well can you stick around and, and help us with it? And I said, well, 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 there's perhaps a role for me then on a part-time basis, but we'll need to find a coach. And one of the coaches just become available as a fan of was Paul Rowley, style of football. I thought, yeah, that'd go down really, really well. So. Eric knew him as well and I had dealings with him and so we kind of from then on in with the blank piece of paper brought Paul Rowley on board. You know, everything's a task, paying players. It's not just a matter of being paid from a UK bank account. We're overseas, so everything's difficult and unordinary and every form needs signing three times because it's different. So uh, that's the beauty of being in League One. Will we pump everybody? I'm sure the clubs will have something to say about that. Whitehaven, for example, Barrow, very, very strong. To be fair, I joined Toronto more for the fact that it was Paul Rowley in charge. Um, because I had him at Lee Centurion in 2014 and, and 15, a little bit of 16. Um, he was the, the driving force for me to sign there um, because at the time I wasn't enjoying my rugby um, and I wanted to get back to enjoying it and I know I could do that under Paul. Um, so yeah, I signed up, just me and then, you know, players followed. Liam Kay was the first signing, Craig Hall, Always we had to go by the principle is we want this team not to win this division but still be around for the next division. I got a phone call from Paul Rowley. I was, I was out of contract at Wakefield uh, towards the end of the year and the roles rang and kind of you know sold a bit to me towards this, this new venture that's going to happen in over, obviously over in Canada and um, he asked if we could meet up face to face and have another chat with obviously Nobby and uh, Simon Finnegan and we kind of went from there. We went on the road with Last Tackle, filming, trialling ex-NFL players, ex-rugby players, ex-players. For, for our viewers who don't understand, you, if you don't make the cut by 19, 20 out of the college system, 21 in, in, the, in the US and Canada, you're pretty much done. There's nothing other sport to play. So you, all, of that, all of those athletes, I tell you, there's some big dudes and some great athletes out there. So I, in the belief that we'll find some, 
we'll find some players for the Wolf Park. We're in League One. We can afford to coach them up. We can afford to make them better. Last tackle was um, whilst it was a, like a, a docu soap thing. It was crazy, man. <laughs> The boys uh, have found some terrific talent from Toronto, Philly, Tampa, Kingston and, and Vancouver. No, it's, it's fantastic. And we'll get to see how they go, cross-coding a number of players from the NFL and the CFL into, into leagues. Some of this is their first real game. It'll be fantastic. That's, a, that's the first Toronto team, if you like, that went rock and rolled out there. It wasn't part of the professional bits, it wasn't part of this, but they were all watching, we were down at a fancy place to do it. One of the original clubs was Brighouse Rangers, wasn't it? They believe that the birthplace of the game, and we've got Canadians, Americans, Jamaicans all playing against Brighouse Rangers. Oh, I tell you what, that was that was a bash fest that game. And they were so aggressive when we came out. Uh, they were talking. They were, you know, they they smacked us around pretty good a bit. I, I'm glad we stuck it out and won that won that game. It's it's a team game, right? Regardless if there's contracts on the line, we we went out there as a team. That's what mattered to me. As I said, this gives us an experience. This makes them know that hey, Jamaicans are here. Some of the species on the team were Jamaicans. So hey, you saying both? We coming at you. I gave it my all. I left it on the field. I I, I have no regrets. I, I made a couple of mistakes. We we all do in a game, but I I think I left it on the field. I put my body on the line. I think I got Shiner coming here in a bit, but. <laughs> <laughs> People talk, talk about the development aspect of the Wolf Pack. That will come. I never had any doubts of it, but it might take 20 years. If you look at the development in London, it's taken 25 years to get players through. So it's, it's poppycock to think you can create something overnight in relation to, and we'll have a, a stream and a conveyor belt of Canadian players coming on day one. No, you won't. No, you won't. Grow up. Um, sat, sat around the table at training one day, and obviously Rolls, Finney, uh, Aggie and, and Nobby asked me to, to be captain, which you know, you know I was proud of. I'm, I'm not really much of a talker, um, you know, in, in teams and that. I'm more or less just do what I have to do and, and get by. So it was definitely something different for me. If you had a decent name, if you were a Fooey Fooey Moy Moy, you were in. Because like this is new in, in Toronto. Is, there's actually a name called Fooey Fooey Moy. Yeah, that's him. And not only is he Fooey Fooey Moy Moy, he's 12 feet wide. It's four feet tall, hits the line like a, his nickname's a car crash from Australia. People will come just to see that. So, we, we, was it a crazy gang that first? The, I tell you all, they enjoyed each other's company. Obviously, there was Fooey, but he, he kind of kept himself to himself, slept a lot. But a big man, in it, so he needed his sleep. And we had this one fella called the Beast, Nathan Campbell. And Fooey had this weird, weird obsession with him where he just followed him round. He started. Um, Started him giving him lifts, places that he didn't need to go, and I think he was on the verge of getting him a, a restraining order from Fui Fui Moi Moi at the time. Organising Toronto to the satisfaction of everybody, it was a shot in the dark initially. Clearly there'd been teams that were half amateur, some maybe semi-pro that had represented Jamaica and Canada national team to get them in. Bear in mind, USA, bear in mind, a lot of these people pay their own way to play for their countries. And so we've got into a professional environment and we get Oxford coming over for our first game. First of all, no one knows this. When, you, when you're using an artificial pitch, you need to have it approved. So it's, there's only a few companies in the world that are licensed to test artificial pitches. So we had had our pitch tested six, seven months prior and it passed. But I get a call from Ralph Rimmer. And he says, we've got a major problem here. I said, what is it? He said, Labo Sport have called and have said that they made a mistake six months ago and actually you slightly failed one of the tests. So we've got this plastic pitch at Lamport that we think is a U but it doesn't meet the requirements. So you've got insurance issues, you've got all of these things that you're only thinking about in the first few weeks and it's getting closer and closer and they're on a plane, Oxford, and somebody's saying you ain't playing them. Well, I, I think you're fine they're on a plane. 
So we're gonna, then we're going straight back around again. The day before the test, I'm speaking to Ralph and he says, you understand if you fail this test, we can't let Oxford play. There will be no game. The facade of, of the Wolfpack is exactly what you see. It's brilliant. It's shiny. It's everything that you touch. It's the way forward for me. It gives us things like that. But behind the scenes, it was like being like Charles Manson. It was Elter Skelter, Elter Skelter, Elter Skelter fixing problems on the run. Labo Sports showed up with their machines and started testing. So I threw up a few times. Usually they take it back to the lab and get the results, but they know the results while it's happening. They've got a reader, they're reading the results. So I'm like hovering over the, the lady while she's doing the test. She's got, they've got like half a million dollars worth of equipment around. And to the credit of the City of Toronto grounds crew, we passed the test and were able to play the game. That was one of the biggest hiccups in the Toronto Wolfpack's history. We almost didn't play our first game. And we get Oxford coming over for our first game right from day one. Uh, it was, we'll get the best players we possibly can to entertain the best we possibly can for the fans that are going to come. It's a bit like that film, that was like Kevin Costner film, Feel the Dreams, something like that. I, nobody came at first and I can show you pictures in year one in League One when you're thinking, <laughs> but it grew and it grew and it grew because the product is good. It was brand new, uh, we didn't know what, what was going to happen really. Um, even when we was going into the first game over there, it was, you know, there wasn't much crowd and we're thinking, you know, oh, we've done the right thing. I remember getting ready and changing and then going out for warm up and thinking, it's not working, like, it's not going to work this. I'm looking into the stands and they were like, there must have been 20 people, something like that. I thought, oh no, kind of, what have I done? <laughs> and then, uh, Went back in, came out for the actual game and then just floods of people just turned up out of nowhere. The captain Craig Hall walks out on Lamport Stadium for the first time for the first ever transatlantic professional sports fixture. This is history. The crowd is huge behind us. Thousands of locals pack in to see Rugby League for the very first time. It was a surreal experience seeing the team run out for the first time because a lot of people doubted that that would happen. Even after we were approved, um, even after we signed with Air Transat, still people didn't believe. So it was nice to prove the doubters wrong. Revenge is a great motivation. We knew we were enough to be champions of that division, if you like. Well, that wasn't being disrespectful to any other team. We brought players there that were probably capable, some of them capable of playing Super League, still. I um, mean, you know, I'd spent quite a few few years in, in Super League and obviously it was, it was going down to League One, uh, but that's where you know they had to start. And he'd spoke about Liam, uh, Liam Sarnan, and um, obviously quite a few more names what, what came in. And obviously as the weeks went on, more names kept cropping up and you know the squad that he was putting together was you know it was getting a lot better. I don't want to disrespect um, the league but we was playing in League One and essentially was with um, we was with a top end championship team really. We'd won a trophy, we'd won League One, we were in the championship. So we ended up lifting the trophy and getting promotion which you know to the delight of, of the, the fans what you know had turned up.
every, every team needs a winning song and Bob Bezik turned up. Obviously the Lancashire lads used to travel over in a, in a minibus from obviously Lancashire way up, up to Huddersfield where we trained and uh, they was kind of putting a song together. You know, the, the lads loved it from, from day one. Uh, Blake Wallace always used to get in the middle, get involved and, and start off. I still, being the horrible person, I'm thinking, well, let's just put a strange Super League. We've shown our straps and things like that. We have to fight another year in the championship, and, but the competition goes up. And I thought the competition goes up. I thought better games, better teams coming to Lambo. And my whole thought process behind that was we'll bring some more people to Toronto to see how good it is, how good the event is. I wanted to build a Super League team when we got to the championship. So should we be discouraged from playing overs as it was then for played? No, we shouldn't. So we were looking, we were scouring what we considered to be the best players possibly we could get. And that's been the mantra, get the best you can possibly get um, to get you to Super League and not only get you to Super League, but I knew if, the, if, we, if you're signing the Lussics and the Latellis and the Wilkins and the Thompsons and the Mellers and the, the O'Briens and the Russells and the... And the you're adding to that and you're keeping them together and you're getting them ready for the next adventure, then, then you're in pole position. in the championship and league one trek the opportunity with brilliant aplomb and we've seen some outstanding performances on the back of the one that said we're an hour's drive from niagara falls we're in one of the biggest cities in the world we have got so much to do we can treat this as a, as a bonding with, and if we get our performance right on the weekend when we knock this mob off wow and the teams that came with that positive attitude look at london what they did well done danny ward Losing the million pound game, it was difficult. I think I took it a little bit too hard because I couldn't really have an effect on it. Um, I got injured in the first week of the playoffs playing uh, against Halifax. In all honesty, in the last six weeks, did we perform right from the Featherson game before the playoffs, playoffs started there. Uh, we worked quite on our game. And I'm just thinking, when you actually look at the dynamics of that middle eight, of what we did, we knocked off a couple of Super League teams. We did excellent. We got, we got one game badly wrong. And that, that was because we were out of juice. We pretty much dominated that league all year. And then we came up short at the end. And, you know, seeing players like Rich White and it was his last game, and, you know, seeing him break down. And yeah, it was, it was hard to watch. Um, if I'm honest, the, the club probably, it was probably a little blessing in, in disguise. I don't, maybe the club wasn't ready to go into Super League. So that being out of juiceness, things needed refreshing. Paul moved on. Yeah, I had a really good relationship with Paul Rowley. Um, and it was a shock and it was hard to see him leave the club. He's probably the reason why, where I am, where I am today really. He's formed me into the player that I am. So I've got massive respect for him. So who do you get to coach an expansion club that's got an element of success, element he says, uh, second best British rugby coach has ever been. I keep telling him that, but it's not true. He's probably the best with his numbers. Um, so, point of call one was Brian McDermott. He'd just been left the Leeds club. Didn't quite understand why Leeds had let him go, but they had. So I'm thinking, right, arranged to meet him on a punt. Says, are you interested? I mean, yeah, I think I am. Except in his way. Yep. I think I am. Taking on Toronto's job, would, and I don't care what the outcome is, my reputation won't be damaged because 
if we don't achieve what we need to achieve, and for various reasons, there isn't a Toronto Wolfpack here in two or three years, it won't be anything to do with what I've been doing. And some of the rules that are put in place, you know, may well mean there isn't a Toronto here in two or three years. There's the reality of that. Maybe we'll touch on that in the, later in the interview. That if 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 Toronto is successful or isn't successful, you know, it'll get me guts. It's going to get me guts. And the part where I have a fear about uh, damage to my reputation, it, it doesn't come into it. Already now, Toronto Wolfpack are Canada's team. People are following it from Victoria, BC, all the way to St. John's, Newfoundland and everywhere in between. I mean, I go to Ottawa a lot, obviously. Uh, we're starting a club there. Well, we're moving a club there. And I see Wolfpack hats every time I go. So it's actually Canada's team right now. And it's made an impact that professional rugby, professional rugby league, is now a legitimate sport covered by all national broadcasters and, and media outlets in Canada. Actually, we got as big, I would say, the coverage in Canada is bigger than it is in the UK. One of the pictures of the Blue Jays is on more money than that entire Super League. One, one blow. So if we can just capture some of that enthusiasm and bring that across to the UK, that kind of money is what I'm talking about, then we can go to the NRL and say, well, I'd, rather, I'd like some from the top shelf, not the bottom shelf. And we can go back into Rugby Union like we used to do and say, I'll have him in, min and him. And we'll put him in different clubs and we'll, all of a sudden, you watch the buttons on the seats go up. The time at the Rhinos was, it, it was so consuming that by the time that finished, you just don't just walk somewhere else and go knock on somebody else's door. And, you know, for me, you certainly don't answer, you, you don't start answering phone calls straight away about your next venture. I needed time to reflect, I needed time to get away and have a look at, at uh, what went wrong. You know, what did I get wrong? And, and those, those answers don't come quickly. So by the time Toronto made the call, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to go straight back into work anyway. Uh, but for sure, I, I think there's only one club out there, maybe another club out there that had they made the call, that had, you know, a genuine call, would you like to come and coach us? I think there's only a couple of clubs, and one of them being Toronto, that I would have been really, really interested in. Let's get to the white cone and accelerate to the second white cone, please. So wheels, you go now, wheels, you go now. Make it quick, Ricky, go. Don't wait for him, don't wait for him. Just set off, Bob, go, Darcy, go. Hi, I'm uh, John Kelly, head of S&C at the Toronto Wolfpack. It's, uh, it's five degrees, week five uh, of our pre-season at Platte Lane. Uh, boys, just about to start the field conditioning session. Uh, let's see how they go. <laughs> Same again, please, with Blake's in this time. Twelve. Halfway. The same pace, just make them all. Two more. I right, make these, there's six of these, make them all. Yeah, yeah. Nine, 10, 11, 12, good. Group together. Let me be straight, I, I took over a very, very well coached, uh, <clears throat> uh, a, a pretty smart strategic team. They knew how to play. Uh, they just had the wrong version of toughness and the wrong version of discipline. Uh, and they wasted so much energy in so many different areas of the game at so many, at so many wrong parts of the season. Uh, for sure, the real danger of the Wolfpack and coaching the Wolfpack, the real challenge is, is bringing them back down to earth after they just put I think we beat Dewsbury 70-0. I think it was 70-0 or 70 points to eight or something uh, at our place. 
That's, that's a real challenge though. To genuinely look them in the eye and say, don't get carried away with yourself. That's hard, that's an hard thing to do. And if that's not managed properly, then you end up with a group of men who think toughness is stood at marker, trying to fight somebody, while some bloke picks the ball up out of dummy half and runs straight past you. But you don't care about that. You'd rather have an ambags exchange with some bloke who's clearly doing that to distract you. So uh, I didn't try and pick them up at all. I just simply asked the questions, how on earth did you blokes lose the grand final? What on earth are you blokes doing in this room heading into another championship season? And if you want to carry on with that bull approach uh, throughout this year and throughout this pre-season, you won't be here. I think bringing Brian Mack in, you know, a coach of his, you know, of his stature and what he's won. Um, I think there's that, there's that renowned fear a little bit of, of Brian Mack because um, he separates himself from the players so much um, until we're straight on that training park and it's literally, it's, it's his goal then. So it's, yeah, he's changed, he's changed the way we play um, and, and it's definitely changed his discipline. Did he, did he run into a, a, a swimming sea of calm waters that are turquoise blue and golden sands and beaches? No, there were some issues. We got over that and we got playing, we got playing a brand of football that, that I believe in. Um, coach is doing a good, I'm not going to tell him, pump, not, I, if, if this is going out, he's doing an okay job. Doing an okay job. Not as good as I'd have done it, but he's doing an okay job. Um, so we, we've got McDermott running, Brian running the show, and yeah, you know, me jumping in every now and again when I think it's needed. The infrastructure of the Rhinos, you know, and then uh, leaving them and going to Toronto to to a club that's only two and a half years old at the time. It was two and a half years old uh, by the time I joined it. So you can imagine some of the differences that I encountered. But, uh, they're not negatives. It's just a reality. Anything that's two and a half years old is going to take some. It's going to take some time to put these things in place. So in two and a half years, we're operating at the highest level. We're operating at Super League. We've got to produce a team. I know the six players we'd added that year added to the team massively. Ashton Sims, what an unbelievable ambassador in relation to, um, and the hair. And so you're in Canada. You're in North America. You're in the world of entertainment, and you've actually got a wolf playing for the Wolf Pack. John Wilkin is the bane of my life. He's been in a lot of people's lives, I don't know if you know that, but he's, uh, he, he, he's exactly what it needed on the tin. John's, uh, he's a lot of things, and I, I knew he was a lot of things before, and you know, a skillful guy, articulate guy, clever guy. What I didn't quite get was how tough he is. Now there goes the epitome of toughness. What he does, he takes a few on the chin, all the while watching the opposition and watching where they're a bit skinny, and goes and plays and burns them. He was brilliant at that. It was absolutely brilliant. So that was a massive stroke from Brian Noble to sign John Wick. He was, a, he was such a pivotal blow for us. Two things that, that excited me about Toronto was that it was something new, it was exciting, but it didn't have like a history or a culture. And I've come from St. Helens where we had a big history, illustrious history of winning things and more of a strategic thinker than a physical sort of player for the team. But. I'm enjoying that role, you know, and it's a challenge because like, like I said, St. Ellen's, you walk in, there's trophies, there's pictures of people lifting trophies everywhere. There's, and, and in that actually gives you like a blueprint of how to behave, you know, what the bigger goal is, whereas we don't have that here. So we've got to create that. And that's what fascinated me really, when as soon as I got the call off Brian Noble and, and actually since Brian McDermott has been coach, I've really enjoyed exploring those conversations with him. I think he's been, he's been great for us. That year of the championship, I knew we were a chance. But you know what's at the back of your mind when you've been there? You sat there and you're thinking, we've still got a million pound game, irrespective of it's one up and one down. To get promotion, you've got to win a grand final to get promotion, I don't agree with. I, I said it at the time before our grand final. You can finish fifth and get promoted to Super League. You could be the fifth best team in, in the championship and get promoted to Super League, I don't think that's right. I think the, the most consistent team in the division below should be in Super League. How do you gauge that then against the team that's won it from fifth? You know, my team, when I was at the round, I was won it from fifth. So there's two different competitions here. And what Super League say at the start of the year, you're going to go run a marathon, OK? And the most consistent team in the league all year will not be regarded as champions. That's all agreed by chief execs, coaches, players, everybody, fans, everybody. The most consistent team all year won't be regarded as champions. You don't get the ring, 
you don't get the prize money, you don't get that tag over the whole of winter, and you don't go down, don't go down in history as champions. Because what you're going to do is run a marathon, and at the end of that marathon, you've got an obstacle course. And we negotiated this obstacle course, the playoffs, better than most other people, and won the grand final. And we were regarded as champions, and everybody thought that was a brilliant, brilliant story. So that's not the same as a championship. What people say be before the season, what everybody's agreed before the season is, OK, we want the best team from the championship to go play in the Super League and be able to handle Super League and not get relegated straight away because they don't have the resource or the squad or the, the backing. So I think that's a different criteria to getting Super League. You want the most consistent team from the championship, those who are best most weeks, to be in Super League. If that's not the criteria, I think the people who set the rules have got it wrong. To affect change, I think people have got to speak at some stage and say things which not many other people are willing to, willing to uh, speak about. So our club's got a visa situation, okay, where our overseas boys uh, can't come in the country and can't operate as the same as overseas boys who play for the UK clubs. Uh, all the overseas boys that come and play for the UK clubs uh, can put their kids in schools, can, can uh, register their kids with the doctors and then get a GP and use the NHS. Uh, our overseas boys, while well, spending time in this country, can't do that. Uh, and we have uh, visa issues which we don't seem to be getting much help from. Uh, from too many other people. And we find ourselves in a really, really difficult situation. We were, we were advised when the club was formed, I wasn't here, but when the club was formed, the club was advised that our overseas boys need a certain visa. Now the goalposts have changed on that. And we're trying to find out what the best solution is to get those visas for those overseas boys and we can't seem to get the right one. So Darcy Lussick, uh, we had a week off, Darcy Lussick went abroad. As he came back in the country, he was asked what he was doing and the guy on the, on the border said, uh, you've got the wrong visa for this. And uh, Darcy uh, wasn't being difficult, but he says, well, look, I've been here for a number of, you know, a couple of seasons already, what's wrong? Anyway, the guy won't let him in and sent him back to Australia. And he had to go all the way back to Australia. And we got a phone call off Darcy saying, look, I'm in Australia. And I thought he was in Tenerife for a week, you know. Uh, so that was a really difficult one for us. He's somewhere in the ether, isn't he? In the in the Antipodean outback or somewhere. Yeah, well, hopefully he'll be back next week. Um, if not, certainly for the for the Toulouse game. Um, yep, yeah, it wasn't the best of circumstances him leaving the country, but he's gone. We can't do anything about that. It was an administrative error, and he'll be on his way back as soon as we can possibly get him, which will hopefully be within the week. There's a bizarre situation here where some of our overseas boys might not be allowed in the country to play for the Wolfpack while we're playing in the UK. Now that's wrong, that's wrong and maybe that's irresponsible of me to, to let their information out but, but if the Wolfpack get relegated this year that's even worse I think for the game. That would be even worse for the game. Now if we go down this year and we go down because we haven't played good enough yeah, for sure you know there's Let's have a look at that. But if we go down because some of the overseas boys can't get in the country to play for us while we're in the UK, you know, that's ridiculous. It's just a ridiculous situation to be in. I think that could be dealt with if, uh, if certain decisions were made, but we can't make those decisions. That's a, that was a huge disappointment for me because if we're generally truly going to be involved in creating opportunities for players, then we need to resolve those issues. I don't think we've recovered from that just yet. On, from a, a, a bureaucracy point of view, we're still trying to chew through some things there, uh, and we continue to do so. There were noises coming out of the, the Super League and the Championship that, oh, this is too hard to turn around. Like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, coming back Sunday to get to North America, it's just not, it's just not viable. Imagine if you're doing it so that the year we lost the million pound game, we did 16,000 miles in six weeks and it could have been avoided. And that's when I bang on when the people see me on the television, I'm saying, well, this is not fair. You're not being fair to us. It's, it's a little bit an element of, do you know what? Do I think the rugby league set us up to fail? In many respects, I do. 
And I, I'm not embarrassed to say that. I think if you, if you examine some of the things that we've had to do and the hoops that we've had to jump through, it's not necessary. And that's not, not me saying I want an advantage for the Wolfpack or for any expansion team. It's me saying sometimes you have to take steps that make it less difficult. The emergence of us is perceived that we are going to be the death of Championship Rugby League or we're going to be the death of some other clubs. That's the, that's the overriding uh, message that I get from people regarding comments and the way they speak is, you know, you're going to take the place of somebody, you're going to be the death of somebody. It wasn't so much the, the players which made it difficult for us, but the away fans. I found those shocking. It shocked me. We, we lifted the, uh, the League Leaders Trophy at Widnes. And uh, listen, I'm not a soft guy, I'm not a, a, a sensitive guy. You know, it didn't affect me overnight before, you know, it, it, I just, I was shocked at how, how vehement people were at their dislike for this new concept of the Wolfpack. Let me just be really clear, Witness are great as a club, I think Witness are a good club. I think Witness are, uh, find themselves in an unfortunate position. Uh, <clears throat> it's one of those where you, you look at London and you look at teams like Witness, I think they add a lot to the game. I think they've both got, you know, some brilliant history. Uh, but I did, the club, you know, I mean, uh, they were certainly good with us on game day. The fans, though, it was the fans I'm talking about. I'm making a specific point about fans who've been watching the game for lots and lots of years, and and, and people fear change, don't they? Everybody fears change, and especially rugby league fans. You're going to have to wear it. Some rugby league fans that you, you're going to have to be accused that some of our fans do not like change, and even if it means change for the good of the game. Uh, it would seem to me that some fans would rather their club is really healthy, but the game in itself is not, as long as their club is healthy. We've got expansion clubs like Catalan and, and Toulouse, but to have one in North America, um, which then probably paves the way for other North American teams to potentially join, it's only expanding the game, which I can only see which a positive thing come from it. We have now 12,000 new people watching Rugby League, and they love it but their knowledge is becoming better and better and better. And the kind of traction you can create in North America in relation to noise, I call it noise, and movement and entertainment, we get half of a half of 1% of that market in Toronto, and you watch the Super League explode. Toronto is a global brand. Rugby is a global brand, and, and all we do is join them. Absolutely. You know, if you. If you can have a beachhead into the North American sports market, which is Toronto, I mean, you look at you know the Leafs, you look at the Raptors, you look at TFC, you look at the Jays. These are the biggest you know franchises in North America, and, and we're in the same we're in the same we're in the same group. Of course, we're like a little brother, but we're in we're in we're sitting at the table. The sport, the product, is world class. It's quality. And, and people have already got behind it. Who would have thought three years ago that you now have, you know, ticket touts selling, you know, our 20 buck tickets for 200 bucks outside the stadium to for people that want to get in. We are the dead. We are the dead. And we are here. And we are here for the black and white. For the black and white. And we will share. And you will fear. I thought it was a really irresponsible thing for David to say. I, I think it was massively insensitive uh, and uh, just stupid, just stupid, you know, and, and put Joseph Kenger in a real embarrassing situation, you know. At no stage would he ever defend what David said. Crazy, just irresponsible thing to say. Not racist, though. I don't think it's racist. Uh, define racism, I don't think it's racist. I think it's maybe. I think the mayor of Swinton needs to have a word with David because I think he's having a crack at Swinton, you know, and their perceived stereotypical northern town type of thing. Uh, but for sure, that was that was hard headlines for for the club and for David to to deal with over the next coming weeks. Uh, and 
I don't think I'm going to follow up with. But David did this, so it's okay. I'm not. I won't follow up with any of that. Uh, David stood down. You can't have an executive with the club, whether you be chairman, chief executive, or anybody being as irresponsible as that and saying things like that publicly. You can't have that. David did the right thing, stood down. Uh, we subsequently we put Bob Hunter in place. Uh, Bob Hunter is a, a, a brilliant operator. Worked with. Uh, MLSE uh, for a number of years knows what he's doing and you know the club's in a really good situation now in terms of the uh, infrastructure off the field. It just is the greatest city in the world. Friendly, everyone is welcoming. You know most of, the, of Toronto is are from somewhere else. I'm from somewhere else. You've got an enormous number of people from the UK who now live here. Either they're you know first generation or second generation and this helps to like reunite it back into the UK. Where are you, where are you going to watch the game? I'm watching it at mine. A at your house? My friends are getting together. I might join them, but they've got like, something going on together, so it looks like I'm going to be watching it at mine. All right, excellent, excellent. Well, make sure you uh, like tweet, because you know, I've been looking at our tweets. We've got uh, Mongolia, we've got uh, Palm Beach, we've got uh, Venice Beach, we've got Mount Mananugu in uh, the South Island of uh, of uh, Kiwi Land, like uh, Corfu, all sorts of crazy places are watching this game. So just text out about that. I think we, I like it. I like that a lot. Where, where, where are you now? I'm, I'm standing in Nathan Phillips Square. You know the big square uh, with the Toronto sign? All right. All right. Cheers, mate. Big hugs. All right, mate. All the best. All right. Cheers, mate. Bye. It was a bit, it was a bit of a rocky start, but but uh, Jose is like a is quality. Jose is a quality man, and. Uh, you know, what I did was wrong. Uh, and Jose's got a big heart. I remember the start of Super League in 96. I couldn't wait to watch every game at the weekend with the stars that we were bringing from Australia. So I was at the back of my mind. How do we generate enough income for our game to bring those stars back again from the NRL? If you want young people to watch that sport, if you want young people to be involved in that sport, you've got to show them the stars. You know, we're, we're now getting our value for money because we know how to spend money and why we're spending it. Uh, we, we put in circa 21 uh, plus million Canadian over three years. The reality is I had a very good team. I conceded that all the way through the championship. I had a very good team, uh, and on the field, you know, we were, we were a heavily resourced team. Whilst you're confident, you're never that confident where you're not sat there on the million pound game day, or whatever it was called, the championship playoff between Featherston and the Toronto Wolfpack, with 12,000 people watching in Lamport. And you can't tell me that there was some nervousness from the year before and the people that had been there the year before. But I did, I did know that the, the, the character of this team was of the right character. Although we're great in the in the playoff semi-final against Toulouse and against Featherston, we already played Featherston twice and had two ball-aching games against Featherston. We only won by four points in each game. They were a good team that year. They were really competitive, really tough, really resilient Featherston. Um, we knew it was going to be the same again. So at half time when we was down, uh, nothing was wrong. We have to win. There can be no, there can be no, no loss today. Some of these teams are going to get close to you and they'll tag you every now and again. But you wobble too much because you don't expect to get tagged. Uh, Featherston would tag us all through all the way through that first half. They had a brilliant first half. Let's go boys, let's go. Last tackle. Just bring the magic. Bring the magic. And we came in at half time and it was as I expected. Go out there, roll your sleeves up. One or two things that we needed to change, we were moving too slow. It wasn't the easiest of second hours, but we finally broke Featherston down. Uh, I thought it was a great game for Yeah, baby! Yeah! Yeah! All the belts of uh, like uh, fighters, 
all the belts of WWE, they're all made in Ontario, as it so happens. So, so we decided we would make a belt and we would give it to Ashton Sims. Sunnyville thing is not quite as mental as people are making out. At the club behind the scenes, we talked about Sunnyville for two years. You know, our ownership group is smart. So let me let you in on the secret is that for you to buy a franchise in America now for the MLS, the soccer, Major League Soccer, I think we sell like up to 300 million, depending on where you want to put it. That's a lot of money to buy a sports club. The two biggest things that their CEO happened for the MLS, so the whole thing was the signing of David Beckham, LA Galaxy, a superstar, a world, the only, only footballer that would be world renowned that could have that kind of traction down in Los Angeles. And the second one, interestingly, was the allowing of Toronto Football Club into the MLS. The two biggest decisions, bar none, he said. He's an impressive guy for sure. He's got an impressive CV continues to be an impressive athlete, but realised why I was out there. And we asked all we asked all sorts of questions of each other. He verbally machine gunned me for about two hours about who we are, what do we do, how does the working week look, what's the team look like, and what are our chances, and all sorts. Wanted to know how we defended, how we attacked. It's great. And I was really pleased he was asking all those questions as well. And I only pretty much went out there to ask him one question and said, look, when all the headlines have calmed down and we're about round five, round six, round seven, it starts to bite a little bit, round eight, round nine, you've picked up a niggle. Uh, and we're away at a ground where there's no TV and it's still winter and it's hard. The referee's having a bad game, which they do. And we're on the back foot and we're 10 points down uh, and it's hard, it's just tough and you're uncomfortable. And no matter what you do, it just seems to hurt. Everything hurts. Are you still going to put your hand up and carry the ball for us? Firstly, I talk about on-field. I believe in what what Brian, his theory, and what he was trying to achieve um, on the field. Uh, I think it's it's. Uh, I think the way my style of play. I can, once I fill into what they want to do, hopefully I can add my little bit of flavour on there as well. It seemed like forever to actually get the deal done, but today is a just a marquee day for our team and our franchise, and uh, we're tremendously excited about this opportunity and and to bring a player of that caliber, that athleticism, is just set us on a whole new pedestal. He is an iconic person as well as an iconic rugby player. We want the people of Toronto and the people of Super League to see the best players on the planet. We think we've ticked that box. There's some exciting, exciting players in there and um, some, you know, really uh, experienced old heads in there as well that I'll be, you know, teeing up with again and I think all of that um, added together uh, the excitement of being in, in, the, in the Super League this year. Um, it's exciting and it's, it's a formula for success. So God willing, uh, God willing, uh, this year is, is, is just that. He talked about earning the respect. He's earned, he's earned a lot of things in his life, he said. Uh, he's earned the right uh, to, to be the bloke who he is today. And he certainly needs to earn the respect of the players and coaches first. And he said, I'm going to spend the first third of the year just trying to earn all those rights to play towards the back end of the year. So, you know, he answered it in a brilliant way. If you're in a competition, I think your reason for being in that competition is to win it. Win the competition. You can say all the political things you want. Oh, we're in this play. We go by the same rules as anybody else. If we get busted and we're unhealthy, it'll be hard for us to compete week in, week out. Uh, I've never seen a game that I didn't think I could win. I know the head coach thinks the same way. People say, why? Why not? It angers me that somebody would say, you're in this just to make up the numbers. I just, I think that's pointless. And you've just asked me a question. Are we here to make the numbers up or are we here to be competitive, right? I believe we could win a grand final. Genuinely, I do. But I've got to tell you, there's a real risk we get relegated this year as well. And it will be to do with performance.